Hey guys, Mike here. Uh, today I'm going to show you how I build a mortising gauge. And this is a sample of the gauge we're going to be building. It's got some pretty good features, I think. Uh, it has two sliding beams that allow you to set the distance between your pins. And it has a thumb screw to lock the beams together. And then you use a wedge to set the fence the distance from your pins. So uh, let's get to building. Oh, and by the way, uh, if you stick around to the end of the video, uh, I'll give you a little bit of information about how you can enter a drawing to win this. Uh, James Wright at uh, Wood by Wright is doing his 2017 tool giveaway. So along with this uh, mortise and gauge and a number of other handmade tools. So uh, be sure to stick around for that or check the links in the description below. Okay, I started out with a piece of hickory, about seven eighths thick. Uh, this one's about three inches wide. I cut it eight and a half inches long but I already had a separate piece that I could use to make the wedge from. Uh, if you're making this all out of one board, you should probably cut it about 10 inches long. That'll give you enough material for your wedges. Uh, in fact, it'll give you enough material to make more than one wedge in case you happen to screw one of them up. Now, uh, like I said, I'm using hickory here, and it, this is a recently sharpened saw, and I had to cut the clip because this is really long. It took a long time to cut through that with a 14-point saw. Uh, I went ahead and cleaned up one face and uh, got it nice and flat and then I squared an edge to it so that I'd have something to run up against the fence on my bandsaw. I put my reference face against the table and my reference edge against the fence and I cut a piece just slightly over two inches that way I'd have a little bit of material to uh, take out the saw marks. Uh, that left me with about an inch uh, width on the other side that I'll use for the beams. This is the separate piece of material that I had. Uh, I'm going to resaw it down uh, to make the wedge. Uh, the wedge ends up being about 5 sixteenths thick, so of course I cut this a little bit oversized so I'd have uh, some material that I could clean up the saw marks. And here I am doing just that, cleaning up the, the resaw marks um, with a smoothing plane. And I'd leave this, once you get it flat, you can leave it a little bit thick because you can always take a little more off it later as you fit the wedge. These are the three pieces I've cut so far. On the right will be the stock that we'll make the fence out of. In the center is the stock we'll use to uh, rip in half and make the beams from. And of course the wedge is on the left. Um, this is still a little over two inches wide and I'm marking it out a little over three inches long uh, because we'll have to glue two of these together to get the thickness that we need. These are the two pieces as they came out of the board sequentially and you just want to pick one up and stack it on top of the other. That'll give you the best grain match so that when this is finished it'll appear that it's made out of a single piece of wood. There are two different ways you can do this. In, in this case I went ahead and glued my blocks together and then cut my mortises and then resawed the blocks and cut my wedge mortise. Um, in the past I've made gauges where I've uh, put a reference edge and a reference end on both boards, marked out my mortise, mortised both pieces and then went ahead and cut the, the mortise for the wedge in one of them and then glued them together. You have to have a really well fitted beam that fits really tight in those uh, mortises so that you can use that to align the two pieces when you glue them together. Uh, and that's the case regardless of how you do this. When I clamp my glue up, I was careful to try and get my reference edges uh, as close to in plane as possible so that when I square this back up, I won't have to remove very much material. While the glue is drying on the fence, I went ahead and started on the beam. Uh, I took it back to the bandsaw and resawed it into two smaller boards and then cleaned up the saw marks with a plane. Um, you want to leave these oversized for now. When you cut your mortise through the fence, you want to be able to uh, plane down gradually on the beams to get a really tight, snug fit going through that fence. I used a spring clamp to hold the two pieces together so I could edge plane them to the same thickness. I checked my progress with dial calipers to make sure that I had the, the beams parallel along their length and also that I hadn't gone too far. I wanted to make sure they were still oversized. 
I put both pieces against the fence on my shooting board and then cleaned up one end. Uh, this will give me a reference edge or reference end to use to lay out the pin locations and the slots in the beam. After I pulled the fence out of the clamps, I went ahead and four squared it so that the faces and the edges were parallel with each other and everything was square to everything else. Then I put it on the shooting board and shot the end, which would be the top of the fence, uh, made sure it was square to all four faces. I laid out the mortises on both the front and back faces. I centered it across the width and then put the top edge of the mortise 11 16 from the top of the fence. I marked the center of the mortise on both sides and then drilled halfway through from each side uh, with a 9 16 Forstner bit. I used a half inch chisel to deepen the uh, layout lines on the mortises and then I proceeded with a quarter inch chisel to start cleaning the waste out of the corners and just kept working with it until I could get a bigger chisel in there and worked from both sides to make sure that my mortises met up in the middle and that I didn't have any undercuts. This was pretty time consuming uh, since I was working in hickory and since my workpiece was so thick. Um, if you were working in beech or some other wood it would be a little bit easier and also if you choose to mortise each half independently before you glue them together um, that probably will make it a little bit easier too. After the mortise was cut I started working on the beams and trying to get them fitted to the mortise where there was really a snug close fit where you had to push it through with some pressure. Um, I also double checked to make sure that the beam was square to the face of the fence in both directions. Well mine was a little bit out of square so I just uh, planed the face of the uh, fence to square it back up with the beam and then squared the sides to match the new face. Once I decided we were all back in square, I headed back to the bandsaw and I resawed the piece right down the glue line uh, to separate it into the two halves again. Back at the bench, I cleaned up the saw marks, being careful to keep everything nice and flat. I stacked the two halves back together and then inserted the beam to make sure that uh, it was still square to the face of the fence. On the inside face of the back half of the fence, I uh, went ahead and laid out from the bottom of the mortise. I came up into the mortise uh, about a 32nd of an inch. I'm going to recommend that you go a 16th of an inch. It makes your wedge fit a lot better. Uh, makes it easier to, uh, to build the wedge and make it work. Um, so a 16th of an inch up from the bottom of the mortise and uh, then scribe a line straight across. Here I've already laid out the, the bottom line for the uh, wedge mortise and it turned out to be right around five degrees. Um, on the narrow end, I think it ended up being about nine sixteenths. If, you know, if you're a little over that, that's probably fine. Uh, and on the wide side, it ended up being about three quarters. So just kind of rough those in because you're going to build the wedge to fit whatever uh, shape you make here. You can pair out a knife wall on both of those scribe lines. Just make sure you do it on the waist side. Uh, this will give you a, a little bit of guidance for your saw because what we're going to do is just take a hand saw and cut on just on the waist side of that line on both lines and then use a chisel and a router plane to remove the waste. Just start your saw in that little trough you've created and just be careful not to let it skip out of there until you get it started and get going. Uh, be mindful that you're needing to saw straight down. Don't let it undercut or, or if you're going to have anything happen, let the saw drift into the waste. Um, you can always chisel that out later. Once you've made your saw cuts down to your 5 16 depth, uh, go ahead and take a chisel and start working away the waste. Uh, work from both sides so that you don't uh, break out the fibers on the far side. And uh, you can use a router plane when you get down to your close to your final depth to get a nice flat bottom in this. If you don't have a router plane, uh, you can fabricate one, but if you don't want to do that, you can get it flat enough with a chisel. Just take your time and, and uh, be careful. Just make sure your chisel's nice and sharp.
again, when you're using the router plane, uh, be sure and work from, you know, halfway through from each side uh, so you don't chip out the, the fibers on the opposite side. I've roughed out the shape of the wedge and now I'm just doing some cleanup with the chisel to get the saw marks out of it and, and uh, start to fit it to the, to the mortise. This is just one of those things you'll have to take some time with, just sneak up on it real slowly because if you try to rush it, you'll end up with a the, the wedge that pushes most of the way through or just doesn't fit the way you want it to. So just take your time and, and uh, go slow. Just keep testing the fit uh, in the mortise until you get what you want. Um, in this case, I've got it where it pushes quite a ways through there, but once the beam is in place, it won't be able to travel that far. So keep that in mind. Um, once you get a fit that you like, uh, go ahead and try it with the beam and make sure that you can uh, get it to lock nicely. And as you start to, to uh, work on the, the notched end of the wedge, uh, you'll just have to keep whittling away at that until it will slip through that 9 16 opening but not be able to come out when the when the beam is in place. I use a chainsaw file to put a notch uh, in the wedge. It, it, having a nice rounded inside corner there looks better than having a sharp corner. Uh, if you don't have a chainsaw file, any kind of a round file or round needle file, uh, whatever you have. When you get the wedge to its final size, it should be able to slide through uh, the mortise when the beam is out, but when the beam is inserted, it shouldn't be able to back out, it should be captive. Once the wedge is finished, uh, go ahead and put the two halves together with the beam and slide them together and make sure you get a good flat uh, glue joint there so there won't be any gaps. Um, if it's got any problems, go ahead and touch it up with a plane until they both meet up really nicely and uh, we're going to use the uh, beam to keep it in place while we glue the two together. When you do the glue up, you're going to use the beam to align the two halves as you glue it together. But once you get it clamped together, go ahead and pull the beam out and make sure there's no glue inside the mortise. Um, get it cleaned out if there is, and then recheck to make sure that the beam still goes through and everything's still aligned and hasn't slipped. This is the bottom beam. It gets a quarter inch mortise. So I'm using a brad point bit uh, with a fence on the drill press to keep it centered and I'll just drill a series of holes and then clean those out with a chisel. The upper beam gets a slot uh, milled in it uh, for the adjustment bolt to go through and I'm using the same fence position as before. Uh, rookie mistake, I forgot that I needed to change my drill bit so I just drilled a quarter inch hole where there should be a 3 16 inch hole and I'll, I'll catch that here pretty quick. Um, so after building a new part, uh, I changed drill bits and uh, continued on. So here are the two halves of the beam uh, ready to be chiseled out. I used an eighth inch chisel to remove the bulk of the waste uh, in the mortises and just very carefully lifted it out of there and worked from both sides so that you don't uh, break out the other side. I've got an assortment of music wire, so I picked out a piece that was 78 thousandths in diameter and cut a t couple of pieces off and chucked them in the drill and used them on the grinder. This is the best way I've found to get a nice sharp concentric point on your pins. I ran both pins on my diamond stones and went through all the grits to further refine that edge and try to make it as durable as possible. Uh, I even took it and uh, ran them on my leather strop at the end. This is the pin support that rides inside the mortise on the lower beam. It uh, attaches to the upper beam and the pin passes through it. So to start off with, uh, it's a quarter inch wide by three eighths thick and I'm drilling a 76 thousandths diameter hole which is two thousandths smaller than the pin diameter. Now this is really close to the end of this part. It's only about three thirty seconds from the end. So uh, what I'll do is uh, drill this out to the same size as the pin later, uh, but I'm going to use this as a pilot hole to drill through the rest of the upper beam.
The pin support needs to slide freely in the mortise. Uh, it doesn't. You don't want it to be sloppy. You want it to be a close fit, but but not uh, bind in any way. I drilled the hole for the other pin. Again, two thousandths undersize, so it'll be a tight fit. I'll go ahead and cut the pin support to three quarters of an inch long and uh, you want to make sure that the ends are nice and square and that when they slide up in the mortise that they butt all the way up into the corner on each end. The pin support slides back and forth in that mortise but it has to be glued to the upper uh, beam. So what I'm doing here is uh, lining everything up and I'm going to mark where the ends of the uh, glue should go. So uh, set the pin support where it'll be when it's finished and marked both ends and then I use uh, super glue gel and uh, just glue it in place with that and you want to be a little bit careful here you don't want to overdo the glue uh, you're going to any squeeze out is going to cause you problems uh, so you want to hold it in place long enough for the glue to grab but you want to take the beams apart before any squeeze out glues everything together after the glue sets I'll take a 76 thousandths drill bit and uh, I'll use the uh, pin support as a guide to drill through the, the upper uh, beam. So this bit's going all the way through both parts. Um, once you get that one drilled, I'll change out to a 78 thousandths drill bit and we'll drill just through the pin support. It'll still be a good fit in there, but it'll reduce the possibility of splitting that uh, when we drive the pin in. I've reassembled the two halves of the beam and I'm using a transfer punch to mark the location of the hole that I'll drill in the beam that'll be uh, threaded for the set screw. Um, you could use the brad point bit uh, to do this if you don't have a transfer punch. Went back to the drill press and used a number 25 drill to uh, drill the hole. Uh, if you don't have a 25 you could use a uh, 530 seconds and that's pretty close back at the bench and I'm using a 1024 tap and I'll run this all the way through. When I cut threads in wood um, I like to toughen them up a little bit. Um, this hickory is probably pretty strong and for no more pressure than that set screw will get it'd probably be fine but uh, in MDF and other materials I've always taken the thin super glue and saturated the threads as much as possible, let it soak in. And uh, I think that helps uh, strengthen the threads a little bit. And once, it's, uh, once the glue is completely set, I just run the tap back through to clean out the excess. At this point, you can make any final adjustments for size on the beam to make sure that it slides freely through the, through the fence. Uh, you don't want it to be loose. You want to make sure that it, it's a smooth action, but that it, uh, it doesn't bind. Also, it's time to take the wedge down to its final thickness. I left it thicker than it needed to be, so once this is glued together, I had to thin it down to make it fit through. And you don't want it to be sloppy in there either. You want it to be a, a nice fit. At this point, I just uh, did a little clean up on it, re-squared everything if, if it needed it, and uh, got ready to cut it to final size. The shape on the left is what we're going for. The mortise is 5 16 wide and we want to have 5 16 material on the front and the back of it. After cutting away the excess material and cleaning up those faces, uh, I start to mark out the uh, bevel that will be on the back of the fence. Uh, you can see there it's even with the bottom of the mortise for the wedge and it goes down to about 3 8 thick at the front of the fence. Uh, that way you don't actually cut through the glue line at the bottom. Here I'm just sawing off that back corner and you can see how it's beginning to take shape. When you cut the bevel you want to be sure you're doing it on the back side of the fence otherwise you'll end up with an exposed glue line like the one on the right. Um, you also end up with a left-handed gauge. You can use whatever tools and methods you like to make the tombstone shape on the top of the fence and round over the bottom corners. Uh, I decided to go ahead and put a 3 16 round over on the back side of the fence just to make it more comfortable in use. Uh, 
you could also round over those edges with a spoke shave or a block plane or a file or a rasp, whatever you have. The last bit of shaping I did, I clamped the two uh, beams together and just took a chisel and chamfered the corners on the ends just to make them a little softer. You can use whatever finish you like. I used the Chris Schwartz um, workbench finish, which is equal parts of oil-based varnish, boiled linseed oil, and odorless thinner. I used a small piece of t-shirt to wipe on the finish and I just did a single coat. I cut the pins about a sixteenth inch long and I used a piece of tape to mark exactly where I needed to grind to the finish length and took them back to the grinder and brought it right down to that tape line. Before I inserted the pins, uh, I ran the drill bit through the holes one more time and then I oiled the uh, pins to make them slide through a little bit easier. Um, I used a backing board and I tapped the pins in until the point just started to come through and then placed it over a small hole on that board so I could drive it the rest of the way through. On the lower beam, the short pin will go in there and it should be flush on top and that'll leave 3 16 sticking out the other side. On the upper beam, you just want to make sure you have 3 16 at the bottom and if it sticks out a little bit at the top, that's fine. This last step is purely optional, but I used some brass ager to darken the brass parts um, so they wouldn't have that kind of ugly yellow color to them. I'll be uploading this project to simplecove.com, so there'll be drawings and a little bit more information there. Um, also, I'll leave a link to the Wood by Wright uh, YouTube channel so you can find out more about the tool contest and how you can win this or another prize. I know this video was kind of long, so I appreciate you hanging in there, and we'll see you next time.